Back in the early 2010s, Chad Moldenhauer and Jared Moldenhauer set out to make a game with an art style that reflected cartoons of the 1930s and a gameplay style that paid homage to the tough as nails run and gun games of the 1980s and 90s. After many delays and a long time in development, that game would finally take on its final form as 2017's Xbox One and PC game, Cuphead. For the majority of this video, I'll be focusing on the PC version of the game, but I'll also take a look at the brand new Switch version to see how it stacks up. With that said, Cuphead. It wasn't until E3 2014 that Studio MDHR unveiled Cuphead to the world, and it sure did turn a lot of heads, but that didn't mean that it was close to completion. After some delays, it wouldn't release until September of 2017. But when you see the game's art style, it's clear to see why the game took so long to make. Cuphead plays in 60 frames per second, but its animation runs at 24 frames per second, typical for film. But we're dealing with hand-drawn animation here. Every frame is painstakingly crafted by hand, meaning 24 drawings per second. While some characters do move about more than others, even the less lively ones aren't static. Just a simple hip sway would have taken the animators a lot of time to make, and there are probably hours worth of animation spread across the whole game among the different bosses and enemies. This isn't just an imitation of old school animation. This is old school animation, imperfections and all, and it's glorious. Like, it's only 24 frames per second, but damn is it smooth. Characters have this amazing expressiveness that the hand-drawn art style affords. The artists have full control over how a character emotes at every possible moment. Subtlety really isn't the name of the game here. Characters perform over-the-top bombastic motions that not only put a smile on my face as I was playing, but left a lasting impression and created personalities for these characters without any dialogue. One of the animators, Joseph Coleman, mentioned in an interview with Xbox Wire that he watched a whole lot of old Fleischer Studios cartoons, and that inspiration definitely shines through in the art style and character design. For those who don't know, Fleischer Studios were the creators of Betty Boop, Popeye, and some others I've never heard of, like Coco the Clown. On top of the visual style itself, there are also some post-processing visual effects applied to enhance the old-timey feel. First off, there's the film grain effect smeared across the screen. At first, I actually wasn't too big of a fan of just how apparent the effect was, but it didn't take too long until I forgot about it entirely. And to be honest, if it wasn't there, the game might look a little too pretty and, dare I say, modern, which would go against what the devs tried to achieve. There's also color bleeding, which is an option you can actually adjust in the settings. Here's what it looks like on the default setting, not too noticeable. Here's what it looks like turned all the way down. And here it is all the way up. It definitely hurts my eyes a bit on Max. Leaving it at default was fine for me. You can see for yourself that the visuals in Cuphead are pretty amazing, but a game can't survive on great graphics alone. Besides the unique presentation, Studio MDHR's other main focus with Cuphead was its gameplay, which would make sense given its retro sensibilities. Did they succeed in this regard, or did they? Leave the glass half full. Oh wait, Cuphead isn't a glass, he's a cup. A brawl is surely brutal. Andrew Yale. The goal of Cuphead is very simple. It's a game that can be tackled either solo or with a buddy in good old fashioned couch co op. There are three worlds. The first two worlds have five bosses to defeat and two run and gun platforming stages to clear. The third world has seven bosses and two run and gun levels. Sounds easy enough, right? <laughs> oh no. Let's get one thing out of the way up front. This game is hard. Cuphead is known for its brutal difficulty, and you'll be lucky to get through any of the game's levels on your first try, besides maybe the very first boss. But I feel that the difficulty of the game is a topic unto itself, which we'll get into a bit later. For now, let's start with how Cuphead and his brother Mugman control. For my playthrough, I pretty much exclusively used an Xbox One controller. I did dabble in keyboard controls, but I found them cumbersome for this kind of game, and would definitely recommend a controller if you have the option. Something that goes against the retro nature of this game is the fact that it sure uses a lot of buttons. Every button besides the left and right triggers has a vital function. Thankfully, it's all taught to you at the beginning with a short and simple tutorial level. You jump with the A button, shoot with X, use specials with B, dash with Y, switch weapons with LB and lock your character in place with RB. The A button also performs a parry attack when pressed in midair, which lets you bounce off of most pink objects without taking damage. It's a little more complicated than the controls of Contra or Gunstar Heroes, and it definitely takes a bit of time to get used to, especially the timing of the parry. Unfortunately, the game kind of throws you in the deep end at the start, so you don't have too long to get accustomed to the controls before the difficulty ramps up. 
I will say that it had been a while since I played Cuphead before capturing this footage, and I must say, returning to it was a cinch compared to learning the controls for the first time. I guess it's like riding a bike, though I do still occasionally slip up and make mistakes when the pressure's on, like pressing RB instead of B for example. I do like that the most important actions, jump, shoot and dash, are placed on the A, X and Y buttons. Split second decisions that you'll be making in Cuphead usually call for one of these actions, and it's easy to slide your thumb between these three buttons on the flyer with little effort. Xbox controllers aren't known for their good D-pads, the same goes for the Xbox One. It's really not comfortable for playing 2D games, but for some reason I had no problems at all using the control stick for Cuphead. It felt pretty natural and accurate. Here's a strange anecdote. On my first playthrough when the game launched, I remember getting this occasional glitch where the controller would continuously vibrate after I got hit, and would only cease upon getting hit again. In this 2019 playthrough, completely different story. Every single time I got hit, without fail, I got the infinite vibration. This is after this glitch was supposedly fixed over a year ago. I had to go into my controller settings and turn vibration off altogether. Honestly, if this wasn't an option, I don't know if I could have carried on playing, it was that bad. After turning vibration off, you're allowed to enjoy the game to your heart's content, and most of your time spent in Cuphead will be fighting the big bad bosses, as they are the game's meat and potatoes. It does have platforming levels, but as this handy chart from Studio MDHR's website will show you, the game is heavily focused on boss battles. I would argue that it is even more than 75%, and it's a good thing that they are. The boss fights are far and away the best thing about this game. It's what makes Cuphead Cuphead to me, even more so than the visuals. These fights are just so damn fun. The first fight sees you take on the Root Pack, a boss with some simple tails and fairly easy to dodge attacks, nothing too special. The second fight against Goopy Le Grande ramps it up a bit, showing how bosses can have variations within their patterns, within the same moves, and that you have to be thinking ahead in terms of your positioning to avoid attacks. It's a bit tougher, but manageable. After that, all bets are off baby, that's your warm up over. Hildeberg, Ribby and Croaks, and especially Cagney Carnation give you a taste of the rest of the game. At this point, I feel like the difficulty curve ceases to exist. In fact, I found some bosses from the final world easier than some in the first. There's a different kind of change between world to world though. The first world's bosses are more playful, like Mugman and Cuphead are having a fun game. Carrots, goo, a flower, a friendly bar scuffle. The second world is a little more fantastical with a dragon and a genie, and a little scarier with Beppy the Clown. The third world contains more devilish designs, closer to the evil side of things, which is fitting as you're getting closer to the devil, such as a killer queen bee, a mad scientist, and a Medusa looking chick. It's pretty neat. When it comes to the bosses, I definitely have my favourites and least favourites, but the quality differences between is very slim. There really isn't a bad boss fight in the game. Each boss has its own unique set of skills, but the goal is always the same, just avoid attacks and shoot. Some fights have small gimmicks, for example the last phase of the Phantom Express requires you to parry a light bulb to expose its weak point, but things like this are always very easy to figure out. And that's pretty much how a Cuphead boss fight goes down. The first couple of tries are spent trying to get as far into a boss fight as possible while learning a boss's mechanics. This includes where they will strike, what they will strike with, and any tails that the boss may have. This will allow you to work out how to avoid their attacks and how to get in hits while doing so. Some bosses have so many different attack variations that you may not even see them all if you beat the boss quick enough. This definitely helps keep the boss fresh on your umpteenth attempt. With so much happening on the screen, it can all get crazy hectic, and I appreciate that anything on the layer that the characters are on that can be interacted with has a bold outline, making it easily identifiable what you should be avoiding. Every boss has multiple phases, with each usually getting progressively bigger, better, and harder. There are some fights that just add new things to dodge, whereas others are grand transformations. I do like how there are one or two bosses that peter out on their last phase, and sometimes the true boss of the level doesn't show up until the final phase. It's always incredibly simple to figure out how to dispatch your foe, you just have to pull it off in one go, which can be tough as you only have three hits and you're dead. It sounds a bit ridiculous, but here's the thing, every boss in the game only takes about one to two minutes to beat, which sounds really short, and it is. It's just a reminder that you're never far from victory, and even if you lose, it only takes a couple seconds to jump right back into the fight and retry. And the game definitely gives you the necessary tools to take down its many bosses. Getting comfortable with your jump arc and dash lets you dodge most attacks. Occasionally you'll run into a situation where it may seem like there was just no possible way you could avoid an attack, but I really don't think this is ever truly the case. Sure, you may find yourself in a position where you can't avoid taking damage, but that's just it. Your position. If you learn the boss well enough, it's possible to predict everything the boss can do and preemptively stand in a position that is more in your favour. 
Or, you know, you could always just use the smoke bomb charm and blink your way through enemy attacks. Ah right, so there are a bunch of different options you have in terms of equipment. And the good news is that there are different items for different playstyles. Firstly, there's the different weapons. Other than the pea shoot up, we've got the spread shot, chaser, lobber, charge and roundabout. Up to two can be equipped at once and different weapons work for different scenarios. Some of these won't require much precision, like the chaser or roundabout, whereas the lobber and charger require more precision but deal more damage. Each weapon also has a unique shot arc, which makes them stand out from one another and suit different players. I found it interesting how different weapons allowed me to focus on a different part of the screen. Using the lobber meant I had to focus on where my character was to ensure that I was hitting the boss. With the press of a button, I'm now using the roundabout. I can move my eyes to focus on incoming projectiles instead. You can switch between a sort of offensive or defensive mode depending on which weapon you have equipped. And all the while can be constantly dealing damage and never feel like you're wasting your time. On top of weapons, there are charms which can provide a passive effect such as increasing your hearts while reducing your damage output or grant more active abilities such as my favourite, the smoke bomb, which provides invulnerability during a dash. There are also super abilities which can be earned after completing a fun side mission in the mausoleum, in which you get to parade your parrying prowess. Once every minute or so you can use a short, and I mean short, super move. And while it's short, it still feels significant. It can be a little difficult to avoid an attack after doing a super, but that's on you to time your supers better. They ain't free. The existence of super moves adds a bit of strategy. Do you use your super straight away to build up another use, or save it for a more difficult phase? A victory could depend on it. Okay, so that's the on-foot boss fights, but we're not done just yet, as we've still got to talk about the shooter levels. Many retro games had random shoot em up levels to break up the pacing, so Cuphead's gotta have it. And these boss fights might be even better than the on-foot ones, or at the very least, they share the same high level of quality. The design philosophies are pretty much shared between the two, but since you have more maneuverability in the air, there are usually more things to dodge. Instead of a dash, you can use the Y or RB button to switch to a smaller, much weaker plane, which is pretty much a defense only mode. You'd think a cuphead shoot em up would be bullet hell mania, but that isn't quite the case. There are bullet hell moments, but it's a bit more tame than it is in actual bullet hell games. And I think the reason for this is that in Cuphead you have a much bigger hitbox. An absolute onslaught of bullets would have felt pretty cheap, and this way, Cuphead's plane levels feel both fair and fun. They're still hard though, of course. <laughs> the bosses in Cuphead are so, so good. But even though it's the bulk of the game, it's not its entirety, and we do have to talk about the platforming levels. And unfortunately, they're not quite as good as the boss battles. But hey, not quite as good doesn't mean that they're straight up bad, because they're not. They're still pretty enjoyable, and some of them can be just as challenging as the bosses. On paper, they actually sound pretty good. You work through some tricky but fair enemy placement, perform some tight jumps, and wrestle with a fun gimmick in some levels. I think the problem is that dying in these levels over and over again is more frustrating than dying in the boss battles. Dying at the end of these stages means plodding through the exact same area again and again. At least the boss battles have variations and the randomness element that makes them fun to replay. The platforming levels are always slightly longer as well, only by about a minute or so, which does add up on replays. Perhaps they could have done with a little trimming. Sometimes I wonder if the game would have been better if they weren't here at all, but I'm in two minds of that sentiment. On one hand, it would have been more consistent, but on the other hand, I feel like the game feels more whole with these levels included. I don't know, it's a weird one. I want to take the time to talk about the game's difficulty, because I feel this is an area that may scare some people away. Not just how hard the game is, but also the difficulty settings itself. That's right, Cuphead actually has an easy mode, but it comes with a few caveats. Hopefully this part can help you decide whether you want to give the game a shot. Here's a real high-class belt. It's on! First of all, let's focus on the main difficulty, regular. Regular is the standard difficulty, and in order to fight the final boss, you have to beat every boss on this difficulty. It is hard, and there aren't really any shortcuts. Experiment with the different weapons and charms, and pick what's best for you. But if you're struggling with a specific boss, try a different loadout. Every weapon has its uses, but I find the easiest to use for most bosses is the roundabout. In terms of getting better at the bosses, you need to think about how the boss fights. It's not really possible to improvise your way through a boss fight. Be sure to look for boss tails. For many attacks and slight variations of those attacks, the bosses will do a short animation beforehand, or there'll be some sort of visual cue during, letting you know what you have to do to avoid the attack. Learning these is very helpful, and really it's not all that overwhelming. Good concentration is also vital. You gotta be in it to win it. 
With each attack, it feels like the developers looked at it and thought, what can we do to make this more difficult? It's not often that an attack is just an attack on its own. Sometimes small projectiles will fly off, or it might combo into a follow-up attack. For some of the harder bosses, you'll be dealing with around two to four mechanics at any given time, which can sound overwhelming, but I can't stress enough how much practice makes perfect. It's very possible to get through a boss without getting hit once, and it's actually a requirement to get some of the best ranks. Thankfully, it's so quick to jump right back into a boss fight after losing. Your patience and perseverance will be rewarded, and you might surprise yourself with how quickly you see yourself improve. Something that makes the fights feel extremely satisfying and pushed me to keep retrying is that you're never not doing damage. Whenever the boss is flashing, that's some damage, and this is almost a constant in Cuphead. Bosses are positioned in a way that it's almost always possible to get in damage while you're focusing on dodging. Also keep in the back of your mind that you're always only 1-2 to two minutes away from victory because the bosses are so short. And I cannot stress enough how rewarding it is to take down a boss and finding yourself one step closer to beating the game. Okay, even with all of that advice, I'm sure there are many people out there less versed in action games that may struggle on the bosses, so much to the point where they just can't beat them. So what does the simple mode have to offer? Unfortunately, it's a bit of a lesser experience. It's easier in every way, bosses have less attacks and they come out slower, but the big shame of it is that the fights end before the final phase. This means that sometimes the actual boss of the level won't even appear on simple mode. Now, I didn't touch simple mode until I'd already beaten the game twice on regular. Going back to this easier mode, it definitely felt easier, and I had no trouble beating any boss on my first try. But this is coming from someone who had already conquered every level on regular difficulty multiple times. For someone who hasn't, I think simple mode might still be harder than many 2D action games. For that reason, you might as well go ahead and try to beat it on regular first time through. Especially considering that the fights are just better and more fun on regular. If you are really struggling with regular mode, you could knock it down to simple just for some practice. And I suppose playing Cuphead on simple is better than not playing Cuphead at all. The game is more satisfying and more fun on regular mode though, so I definitely encourage you to persevere through it if you can. Furthermore, after beating the game once, an expert difficulty is unlocked. And oh boy, is it brutal. Everything is beefed up on expert and sometimes there are new attacks or mechanics to deal with. Some fights have seen more of a bump than others though. For example, Hildeberg is insanely harder, whereas Grim Matchstick is barely harder at all. With Expert comes the dreaded S-Ranks. S-Ranks in Cuphead will truly make you worthy of that gamer sticker that you've put on your bedroom door. To get an S-Rank, you must beat a level 1 Expert in under 2 minutes without getting hit once, nabbing 3 parries and expending at least 6 super meter cards. Owning these S-Ranks is a gaming achievement that you can truly be proud of but ironically there isn't an Xbox achievement for it. It's just for the truly hardcore. If you decide to go for these, Godspeed. There are some games that can be made easier by plugging in a second controller and having a buddy along for the ride. I always thought that would be the case in Cuphead, but upon playing the multiplayer for the first time, I can confirm that that is not exactly how it works. Let's state for the record that Cuphead and Co-op is awesome. It's a run and gun game and they're usually hella fun to play with a friend. Cuphead certainly isn't an exception, but the experience is a little different in multiplayer. Somehow the game might actually be harder, and not just because enemies health has been scaled to compensate. Some attacks are programmed to follow the player, and in single player you can use this to your advantage by baiting the attack to somewhere where it's easier to avoid, but in multiplayer it's a bit of a crapshoot. It's too hard to work out on the fly who's being targeted. Then there's the case of reviving. After a death, a player can be revived by parrying their ascending spirit. This revives them with one hit point. If the spirit leaves the top of the screen, they're gone for good. In theory, this should make multiplayer easier, and I guess it does in a way, but it also changes your strategy, especially during the shoot 'em up levels. Camping at the top of the stage and lobbing bombs is a great strategy in single player, but if you die at the top of the screen, say goodbye to that cup and or mug. None of this really means that multiplayer is worse than single player, only that how you play is slightly altered. However, I will argue that the run and gun levels are worse in multiplayer. You can't be killed by the camera like in Contra, but the camera does become a nuisance if the players drift too far apart. During my playthrough with a friend, one enemy didn't show up because of the weird camera position and we both died to a random attack from off screen. Because of the increased health, enemies in these levels feel like damage sponges and aren't as satisfying to quickly dispose of. These negatives are annoying, but I wouldn't let them deter you from playing through Cuphead in multiplayer. They're not a deal breaker by any means. What's funny is that the multiplayer mode is kind of the canon mode of Cuphead. The story will always involve both Cuphead and Mugman, and if you play in single player, Mugman will sort of just disappear until cutscenes, which is a shame. 
Although it's not like the story is vital to the Cuphead experience or anything. It's pretty simple. Cuphead gets greedy, Mugman gets sad, and they must collect all of the soul contracts for the devil or face eternal damnation. I mean, you can't get more simple than that, right? But seriously, Cuphead has a beginning and an end and lacks a middle, but that's totally fine. And what is there is kind of cool. Even though the story is simple and sleeps in the background, it shies away from traditional retro game stories like Save the Princess or something like that. And although there isn't much of a story, there are some additional characters dotted across the map to provide some laughs here and there and help paint the world of Inkwell. As you can probably tell, I love Cuphead and I really don't have to give it much more praise to prove that, but I will give it more praise because I can. There are a couple other things I want to mention before I move on to the Switch version. The first of these is something that cannot go unsaid in a video on Cuphead, and that's how good the music is. Christopher Madigan has done a phenomenal job creating new old-timey big band, jazz and barbershop compositions that are both in keeping with the game's art style and also pump you up when the action gets red hot. Quick shout out to the sound effects too. The snappiness of the weapons and the voice clips from the characters and narrator fit the game perfectly and are very memorable. Another thing is the easter egg and references to games and cartoons. Seriously, there are references out the wazoo. Here's a list of some of the ones I noticed. They may not all be accurate, but it's fun to imagine that they are. We've got Mario, Rayman, Dragon Quest, Street Fighter and Battletoads, Woody the Woodpecker, Pac-Man, Yoshi, Betty Boop, Tom and Jerry, Iron Giant, Futurama maybe, Fantasy Zone, Mega Man and Sonic, Final Fantasy VI, and Cuphead. There are tons more that I've missed, especially references to old cartoons, and I'm sure I've got a bunch of these wrong. Let me know in the comments any references that you noticed. The last thing I want to touch on is a bit of a downer unfortunately, and that is bugs. For the most part, a high level of polish is displayed in Cuphead, but there are a couple of bugs that definitely stood out and it would be remiss of me not to mention them. Thankfully, they're not too bad. On top of the aforementioned vibration glitch, there was also a weird glitch with the Hildeberg boss. She would never transition into her final phase correctly. The sound would play, but she would just flop her arms around for a bit until around 10 to seconds later, she would finally transform. This happened 100% of the time on every difficulty. Oddly enough, just like the vibration bug, I don't think this one occurred so severely in my 2017 playthrough and have no idea why it kept happening here. Hopefully this is an isolated incident and it's not something that other people will have to deal with. I also had two complete game crashes this time around, always occurring after I beat a boss. Luckily, the victory was saved in both instances, so it wasn't too big of a deal. Still, I'd be lying if I said that it didn't annoy me. But yeah, that's pretty much everything I have to say about the PC version, so let's switch on over to, well, the Switch version. And I've got to say, Cuphead is a perfect fit for the system. It thrives on the try and try again mentality, and that's just much easier to do with a handheld system like the Switch that is so easy to pick up and play. It's important to note that the Cuphead IP isn't owned by Microsoft, but according to Daniel Bloodworth of Easy Allies, Microsoft actually approached the devs about a Switch version. The current relationship between Nintendo and Microsoft is a beautiful thing, and I can only hope that this somehow leads to Master Chief's inclusion in Smash. Wait, what were we talking about? Oh right, Cuphead. How is the Switch version? Well, there really isn't much to say about it, which is the best praise I can give it. Cuphead is pretty much a perfect port, with no discernible difference in image quality or performance as far as I can tell in both docked and portable mode. Portable runs at 720p compared to docked which runs at 1080p, but because of the game's art design this is hardly noticeable. The loading times when first entering a level are longer than the PC version, but not by much. Because of the added option of playing the game handheld, you could argue that the Switch version is the best version. Not to mention that a Joy-Con held on its side has just the right amount of buttons for Cuphead, so co-op action can be enjoyed to its fullest anywhere that you may be. In an airport, at a concert, in the Devil's Casino, anywhere. The Switch version brings with it the ability to play as Mugman in single player, which is a welcome addition. On top of this, some of the cutscenes are now animated, whereas before they merely featured character stills. These additions aren't exclusive to the Switch, mind you. Along with the launch of that version, a patch arrived for Xbox One and PC that adds these additional features. This patch even fixed the vibration glitch, but not the Hildeberg one for some reason. And the controller vibration and Hildeberg glitch were completely absent from the Switch version. Thank God. But there was a new bug that I found in their place. Occasionally, the characters can get kind of juddery. Not only did this impact the visuals, but it also seemed to delay some inputs. This glitch does disappear on a restart, but I imagine this would have frustrated me to no end if I was close to defeating a difficult boss. Hopefully that's something that can be fixed in a patch. 
Besides that, I have nothing but praise for the Switch version. If you're jonesing for a replay or want to check the game out for the first time, you can't go wrong. Cuphead is just a fantastic game and one of the best indie games I've ever played. Its presentation helps it stand apart from pretty much every other game on the market, but it's the gameplay that makes it shine. The challenging but fair bosses left me with this feeling of exhilaration and a sense of achievement that made me want to push myself to the end and replay the game. Thanks to the Switch version, I'm sure I'll be replaying this game a few more times, but whichever system you play Cuphead on, it's a game that I highly recommend. Thanks for listening to my ramblings on Crockery for nearly half an hour. If you'd like to find out my ramblings elsewhere, you can check me out over on Twitter, or you can check out my Twitch channel where, as well as rambling, I also play through games from my backlog, and I'm currently playing through every main console Sonic game to 100%. But until next time, remember to have fun playing video games.